Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of Reverts Reality. My name is Nahila Morales, and I'm here with my co-host, Sister Arenda Datka. Today, it's the two of us, and it's episode 68. Um, today is going to be a series of, uh, of what we call um, the real, raw, Reverts Reality conversation. Um Understanding new Muslims, it's a very difficult topic to sometimes swallow or to sometimes digest because for those who were born in the faith it is kind of almost impossible to comprehend that one's family will leave you because you have entered another faith or that you will lose a job. Like in my case, I lost my job the day I, I started wearing the headscarf. Or that will, you will lose your friends because they can't identify with you anymore. So today we're going to be talking about these different dynamics that happens the day that we embrace Islam, the day that we say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. For many of us, it's the happiest day of our lives. For many of us, is a day of turnaround in our lives is a day where a fresh new star, where we understand that all of our sins have been forgiven and that we are on a path and on a quest and on this journey until we meet our creator. But for many of us also, we have a lot of trials and a lot of turbulence along the way. And to navigate that can become somewhat crushing at times. And we doubt ourselves. And um, I don't know for you, Sister Renda, but for myself, I know when I lost my job, I knew I made the right decision, but I didn't know if I was going to be able to take care of my infant child, right? So you question not the oneness of Allah. Like, we don't question Tawheed. We don't question the essence of the religion. What we begin questioning is why are we being tested in trial with the very little knowledge that we have? And so once we start acquiring knowledge and understand that this life is a test and that we are going to be tested and some of us get tested immediately and some of us are on the ride a little long and then before you know it, we're tested. But that's just part of everybody's journey, whether you're born into the faith or whether you are embrace the faith. The truth of the matter is that, you know, trying to understand new Muslims, new converts, new reverts, whatever label you want to put on us, that shouldn't be the key focal point. It should be that we are now part of your family because we believe that we are brothers and sisters in faith and we have rights upon one another. And what that essentially means is that the Prophet says we have rights upon each other. And so when we are giving salams or not are giving salams, you know, we are exercising these rights. And so it's very important to, for one, remember that we all come from different walks of life and that we all come from different households and we all come from different upbringings, different nationalities, different, um, you know, areas uh, of um, growing up. Uh, you know, the East Coast versus the West Coast, the Midwest versus the South. Um, and these are things that we need to take into consideration for us that are here in this country. Now, to add on uh, fellow brothers and sisters that embrace Islam from different parts of the world, such as India, you know, people do convert that were Hindu ones and they come into the folds of Islam. And so they bring obviously that cultural um, I think of a particular sister who, even though she is Indian and she converted, she still doesn't feel like she belongs to that demographic or that group of brothers and sisters because obviously she had to learn everything. And so we have to be very mind, mindful about the different, um, you know, ways of upbringing again. And the reason why I keep bringing that up is because we tend to put all reverts, all new Muslims in a basket and just, oh, we are labeled as reverts and that's it. You know, there's no individuality. And so I think moving forward, we hope that these videos or these, these, um, 
these different episodes will allow you to understand a little bit more of what it entails to be a convert, um, what difficulties we go through. And inshallah, we will talk about, again, acquiring knowledge and how important that is. Um, SubhanAllah, because only with knowledge do we understand this faith for what it is, not for what we see or what it's been told to us from a screen or from a television or from friends, right? So it's very important to hit the books. And alhamdulillah, we are blessed to be able to do that here at Embrace. So we're going to start off with a list, a very important list um, that we 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 got off the internet, but we can actually um, resonate very well um, about how to actually understand new Muslims, inshallah. And hopefully in the coming episodes, we will be able to answer some questions along the way too. Um, I know we are working on some very special um, guests that will come on. Uh, so once we have those booked, we will have guests that will talk about their experience, inshallah. But for now, it's Sister um, Arenda and myself, and we hope that this is of a benefit. Remember to share this video because there's someone out there that perhaps uh, doesn't know how to deal with new Muslims or just met a new Muslim. As a matter of fact, yesterday in my tafsir class, there was a sister that asked me, how do I introduce Islam to a friend that asked me a zillion questions that are very difficult. And my, my response was just be a friend. You just get to know one another. Um, you will find common ground. You don't have to pour out the Quran or pour out a whole bunch of Hadith. You have to know each other on a personal level, gain that trust in order to be able to share um, your faith with the intention of conveying the message and the hadaya, the guidance comes from Allah. So I think that's very important, our intention and where we're coming from and where we want to go, inshallah, with that relationship or these acquaintances. And so it's so important for us to um, set that mind frame and that intention from the very beginning, even when we meet non-Muslims and are sharing our faith with them. Um, Sister Renda, you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. And also just keep in mind, um, this isn't just a message for those who were born into Islam to understand more about our um, transitional um, challenges <laughs> that we go through, but also for any of you out there who are converts or reverts or new Muslims. If you have embraced the faith at some point in your life, this is to let you know that you're not alone. So there's a lot of things we go through. Sometimes we keep it like in our head, like we're the only ones dealing with this. So just to let you know, you're not alone. And one of the first things that we need to keep in mind about a convert is there, we have a ton of things running through our heads at any given moment. In the Quran, in chapter two, verse 155, Allah says, and we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and fruits, but give, give good tidings to the patient. So when we're a new convert to Islam, we have just made the biggest decision of our lives. And we've changed our religion to one that we're very unfamiliar with. We understand the concept of it. That's why we embraced it. But it's so unfamiliar and so different in so many ways compared to what we're used to. There's a lot of stimuli around us that we're not used to. Um, being in the masjid or in the mosques, hanging out with Muslims. We hear lots of foreign languages other than English or whatever we grew up with. So depending on where you are in the world, um, you know, that convert has a different language that maybe the dialect is different or maybe the language is completely different or the slang or whatnot. Um, a lot of times new Muslims will look uncomfortable because they're not used to their surroundings. It's just very different. And a uh, big change occurs in a convert's life. And that big change, everybody's going to adapt to it differently, right? So when we notice someone who's a new Muslim, we want to make sure we're looking for those little cues, you know? Um, and as a convert, we are learning so much new information, and whether that's before we took our shahada or after we took our shahada. 
And we're always coming across new things. We always have people coming and telling us different information. So it takes a long time for a convert to have a really consistent foundation that's strong enough to feel comfortable in their faith, in the religion. Um, it's, it's kind of like a process, like as if that person was moving to a foreign country, not knowing the language, the customs, the environment that they're surrounded by. And we often don't have really an idea about the origins of those certain customs. So for instance, when I became Muslim, um, the environment that I was around was mostly Desi. So people from Pakistan, uh, the masjid that I attended, that was the majority of them there and some Arabs. But the culture is different than if you go to, if I would go to a, a mosque that was mostly Afghani. So the culture is a little different there. So that's where we're, we're trying to navigate these differences and to understand. Um, and so it takes time to discern between those two and that's okay. Can be frustrating, can take some time, but, but um, that's what's important to know. If you see a convert, make sure you welcome them. And um, if they look like they're a deer caught in headlights because they're feeling a little bit awkward, that's normal. Then the situation of family, right? Mm -hmm. Family life. Um, our family life is uncertain. Uh, for those who are single, well, obviously, they have to navigate with this journey by themselves because they will not have a family member to go to and discuss or break fast with during the month of Ramadan. So we become, again, that family, and we have to be very accessible. How are we accessible by being very compassionate, uh, being very uh, delicate with our words and making sure that, you know, we oftentimes say uh, that hadith very loosely, whatever you want for yourself, you want for your brother. But what does that really mean? What does that really mean to you? Um, one of the things I always hear is like, you know, um, my family is not going to accept me or my family is going to reject me. I am so scared that I'm going to be left without family. And so that's one of the biggest fears for a convert because that's all you know. That's who your family is. I mean, and and obviously on the other end, the family it doesn't know uh, anything about your faith and your learning. So it's very important to try to understand your faith um, based on the simplicity of it, right? Which is the oneness of God, you know, and understand the five pillars of Islam. So when your family is ready, you're able to have these dialogues of getting to know one another and getting to know the faith together, not necessarily converting. Cause I know we go on this high that we want to teach everyone the little that we know, and we want everybody to come on this side of, <laughs> of the garden, you know, because everything seems very fresh and new to us. And we're on La La Land and we're on cloud nine and we feel so happy and we just want everyone to feel the same happiness with us. But oftentimes that doesn't happen. And so, it becomes very difficult when, you know, the convert is expecting a certain um, reaction from a family member and doesn't get that reaction. So obviously disappointment takes place. Disappointment takes place in the home. Now, that's one part of the family aspect. We as community, our family to our converts, imagine if that same disappointment happens with your new family that your faith family right? Which oftentimes happen. What happens to the convert? We lost your sound, Nahela. What happens to the convert? They feel very alone, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you lose me? Yeah, I lost you. Oh, sorry. So what happens to that convert? Yeah, so it does happen to the convert, right, where it feels very lost when it loses community, the community is treating them a certain way, and then your family is treating you a certain way, you kind of just feel lost altogether. And you start again questioning, was this the right choice? Was this 
was this what I'm supposed to be doing? Before I used to have friends, I used to have my family, I used to have A, B, and C. And so it becomes very detrimental for the convert. So we have to be very mindful of the way we treat our converts um, or, or Muslims in general. We should be able to greet one another, you know, a class, like our character, our, our manners should be so on top notch, right? Especially when we're in the house of the creator, when we're in the house of Allah, you know, we should always have that smile. Even if we have masks, we can see when somebody's smiling with their eyes. So have that smile, have, you know, a positive word. And if you're feeling down, you know, stress that. So be able to, to, to be able to express that and say, you know, today I'm not having a good day. And you on the receiving end should be able to uplift. And that's what we need to do as a community and as a family. And that's what family is really about. SubhanAllah, yesterday um, uh, I, I, I found um, Sheikh Omar Suleiman said something that was so beautiful. Um, and I was just like, Wow, this is exactly what we need to think about um, when it comes to family. And he says, to love for your brother and sister, what you love for yourself isn't merely refer uh, referring to caring for their food or shelter or clothing. It also means that you care for their emotional needs, right? And that you love for them clarity. You love them you that you love for them clarity dignity happiness and success in this life and the next so again taking care of each other's emotional needs um is so important because that's where the family aspect comes in right um, we may not be blood related but we are family in in faith and so we will receive backlash from our family and so our community should be there to embrace us to take care of us, to uplift us and empower us and tell us that everything's going to be okay because we are your family. I mean, we we are 1.8 billion Muslims around the world. I personally always say I have a huge family because I consider my Muslim family my family genuinely. And so when we get in that mindset, we will treat each other with that love that each and every one needs because we take each other for what it is, you know, your brother and sister. When we refer to each other as Sister Arenda, you know, she is my sister in faith. I am saying it. So now we have to make sure that we're implementing it. And that's where sometimes we fall short. And sure enough, life is busy. We have all kinds of things going on. You know, we have our own issues. But always remember, you know, that that other person may be going through bigger issues, larger issues. And when we help each other, we essentially are helping ourselves heal. I always see it as a form of healing. Um, but again, be open to express that and, and try to work on that. And if seeking for, you know, uh, professional help is also something that we should, um, you know, not shy away from or put the stigma that going to therapy is a bad thing. No, if one encourages you, one of your family members, one of your community members encourages that, which I often say, you know, have you seek for professional help, we should take it for what it is, a good advice, right? So that's what family, um, and that's what we should be there for one another when we're talking about um, being good family members to one another within our communities. I've always said when I came into Islam, I wasn't really looking for friends. I was looking for sisters and sisters means to me family. Absolutely. Um, really quick before we go on to this third point, I want to say thank you for all of you who are tuning in today live. And um, we have someone tuning in all the way from Algeria, mashallah. So Walaikum assalam to that person. We also have a lot of our regulars on here watching with us too. So um, I would like you guys, whoever is watching, we have a few on still, um, go ahead and share this out to your pages or to groups that you're in so that there's someone who can hear this and benefit from it, inshallah. Um, so the third point that is really important to understand about converts is our friends oftentimes are leaving us. Um, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
said, a man follows a religion of his close friend. So each of you should be very careful about whom he takes as a close friend. I can't um, impart the importance of this statement enough. Mm-hmm. And as a Muslim who's been Muslim 27 years, uh, Alhamdulillah, it is so important to surround yourself with people who are on the same path as you. Um, doesn't mean those can be your only friends, but those are the ones you keep closest to you because they are the ones that are going to help you and support you in that journey. And as we always say, everybody's on their own journey. So we're not all in the same place, but to have that support system in place is so important. Um, You know, some friends are known, if they're good friends, they can be brutally honest, right? Um, And when we tell our friends that we've converted, they, you could have a wide range of, of responses from them. They could be very supportive. They could give you a whole bunch of, uh, throw a bunch of questions or comments at you based on their own perceptions of the faith. But if they're supportive friends, they're going to be really puzzled maybe, but they're going to ask you a lot of questions. And a lot of those questions are really hard for a new Muslim to answer. So it can be frustrating because you know how great the faith is based on your um, research and your understanding, but it's always not so easy in the beginning to explain that to people. And it comes, you know, there's so many different aspects of why we choose to embrace Islam. But while most of us don't get a PhD in Islamic studies before we become Muslim, um, you know, sometimes we feel really pushed into a corner when we're tested by our friends. So that's a big challenge there. And some of those friends may stick around us for a while, but chances are habits are gonna be different because you embrace the faith where your your um, everyday you know, routines are gonna change. And that's gonna happen over time. It's not gonna happen right away, but um, you know, maybe you've denied a few um, outings to go to the bar. This is revert realities, right? We used to be in the in the life of the Jalalia and we were living that life. So friends typically go out on the weekend drinking, they go party, they go to, you know, movies, they go to outings, clubs. And so maybe you're declining those invitations or, um, you know, they're declining those invitations. And so their friends aren't going to stick around that long, right? And after a few times of doing that, they might just stop calling you all together because they don't feel a connection with you anymore. They don't have anything in common with you. So um, friends who seem to have abandoned you can cause a lot of depression. Um, You know, the converts can go through a lot of depression and loneliness and they need to replace that. And that's where, like Sister Nahela was saying, we expect that from our new family, right? Our Muslim family. But a lot of times we don't find that there. And so that's so important for the Muslims in the community when you have someone who's a new Muslim to understand these are these are things they're dealing with on a daily basis. So really important to take them in. Absolutely. SubhanAllah. Um, then, you know, the friend, the friend situation goes hand in hand with, um, our next point, which is, you know, we now, how do we spend free time, right? We have a lot of free time because we're not at the bar on Friday night anymore, happy hour and what have you. And so when our way of life begins to change so drastically, we will have so much time in our hands. And if we do not integrate ourselves into a community or into circles where they will be of benefit to our dean, our growth, then we will feel lonely and there will be a gap where you will find like, okay, now what? And, you know, when we come into Islam, shaitan is like right there trying to distract us, trying to make sure that we go back to our way, our, our ways of jahiliya, right? So it's it's so important for us to make sure that as we are looking for good friends that will help us spend time 
in a very fashionable manner where we are uh, seeking for the pleasure of Allah, where we are helping our community, you know, volunteering is a big thing, making sure that if we have children, we integrate the whole family, which is one of the things that we do here at Embrace. Alhamdulillah, when we do things, we do it as a family. That way, you know, our children, our spouses, for those who are married, um, come together and can gain some reward for the sake of Allah, um, for, from Allah, and do things for his sake. So one of the things that I always um, think about when we're talking about time, um, I always think about Surah, surah Al-Asr, right? And it's like, SubhanAllah, Allah tells us, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Al-Asr, by time, right? Indeed, mankind is in loss, except for those who have believed, done righteous deeds, and advise each other to truth and advise each other to patience. So we have a whole surah that talks about time. And so what are we going to do with that time is so imperative um, because he tells us that, you know, mankind is at loss. We are basically, you know, doing things that are not good for our health, that are not good for our well-being, that sometimes are affecting our family environment. And so unless you are with those that are inviting you to good, are advising you, um, are of the righteous, of telling you the truth, and finally, you know, that tell you, advise you to patience. And that's something that uh, I think the world needs a little bit more of. We are so impatient, you know, if somebody, you know, kind of is at a light and is kind of looking at the sky, the one behind is like already honking. And subhanAllah, that lack of patience that we have, right? Or if we're at the grocery store and somebody's putting their groceries very slow, you know, I mean, now with COVID, it's kind of difficult to say, can I help you? But at least you can help by being patient, right? And so that's where time comes in. You know, if you don't be on such a rush, rush, rush with your salat, with your friends, you know, the Prophet Sassam, when he used to talk to people, he used to stop doing what he was doing and face the individual half of the time we're talking to people and we are on our phones and we're like oh yeah and we continue to be on our phones so we don't give our undivided attention and so i think that's something that we need to go back and as new converts um this is a, an example that we normally use at um our um uh one of our workshops uh basically that we are told since we're little Look at me in the face when you're talking to me. Look at me in the face. You need to show me respect by looking at me when you're talking to me. And so subhanAllah, half of the time we're looking at the ground or our culture is to, you know, our Islamic culture is to lower our gaze. But for a new convert, that sometimes doesn't resonate well because it's seen as disrespectful, especially if that convert doesn't know this ayah in particular or this hadith or anything that alludes to lowering the gaze. And so when you're talking to someone and they're looking down, it's seen as disrespectful instead of respect. And so perhaps educating that new convert as to why are you acting the way you are, you know, um, within this time span that you may have in the most kindest words with the most, um, you know, uh, compassion, um, you know, because that's another thing that the Prophet Sassam tells us when we are about to correct ourselves and each other, you know, do it with kindness. Don't be so hard on yourself and don't be so hard on the other. Um, we are bound to make mistakes. Perfection is only an attribute for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's make sure that we are making the best of our time when we are with our family, with ourselves. Are we engaging with those that are around us and obviously with our community? Let's make sure that our time with each other is of quality versus quantity, inshallah. Absolutely. And it's also, I think I'm just going to pop in there one more thing that goes with that um, for all of you out there to understand a little bit better converts feeling is because their time has changed now since they, when we um, embrace the faith, we're not 
we're not doing all the things we used to do. So over time we stop doing a lot of things and there's a lot of free time and that can that can bring a lot of uh, a lot of more loneliness if they don't have things to put in place of that time lost from their previous activities. So um, that's why it's all the more important to strike up a friendship and conversation with that new Muslim in your community so that they feel like they have someone to reach out to and invite them and, you know, make them a part of, of everything there. Um, the next point, the fifth point is something that is, was really detrimental to my journey. Um, we don't know what to learn and who to learn from. So we might've stumbled upon the faith somehow many different um, circumstances in, in terms of how we found Islam. But when you're there, it's there's a lot of information, right? So in Bukhari, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, make things easier, do not make things more difficult. Spread the glad tidings and do not hate. So in the very beginning for converts, it's really troublesome to figure out the difference in fiqh, which we won't even know what it is at the beginning, jurisprudence. Um, you know, when we come, our backgrounds usually from a religious with a, a very narrow point of view of right and wrong, right? So maybe we came from a church, maybe we came from, um, you know, another, another form of belief system that had a very narrow point of view. This is what it is. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. And so, Often converts think, um, so do I raise my hand after bowing or not? Which one's right? Which one's wrong? Um, and so there's so many things with the wudu, with the prayer, with the um, duas. And so there's so many things that you might get different information from different people. And to try to decipher, it's really difficult for that person to try to decipher what's right and what's wrong. And the fact is, there's many correct opinions regarding these issues in Islam. So that's a dilemma that we have to go through um, in terms of whether we're going to take the easier opinion or the stronger opinion. And it's going to cause some confusion at first, um, but the convert or the revert doesn't have that family behind them to help form those opinions about those things. And so they're getting, we're, you know, we're getting bombarded from all different sides, all this information telling us what we need to do, how we need to cover, what dress clothes we need to wear, right? And another common decision converts have to come to at some point in their journey is choosing between Zabiha and non-Zabiha meat, right? And that's a whole nother, um, you know, Zabiha is when that, that animal has been slaughtered ritually and the name of Allah has been mentioned over it. And non-Zabiha is what we can just go buy anywhere in the grocery store. So in reality, the fact is that there's a difference among the scholars regarding what the meat of Al-Khitab means. So the people of the book, Jews and Christians. So we have these dilemmas uh, in terms of different opinions. And so converts are trying to navigate their new culture, their new environment, their new friends, um, dealing with the pressures from family, from friends, from the, the community. And now they're having to figure out which opinion to take based on all of these, these um, uh, advices they're getting from their fellow Muslims. So they have a limited knowledge at the beginning. So we need to make sure don't overwhelm them. Don't overwhelm them, right? Um, it comes in time. And if we look at the Sahaba, um, you know, and the, the Quran was revealed over 23 years. That's because Allah's not going to put everything on you at once and you have to just learn it. We're born as a baby. We learn step by step, right? So as step by step goes, I think that's another important thing that we need to keep in mind with the converts. If you are a born Muslim or you are part of the Muslim community, immigrant Muslim, is when you see a new convert, they might not be doing things the right way according to your understanding. But you also have to realize there is a reasoning behind that. So rather than um, maybe pointing it out or critiquing, we have to say it in the way that learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how he, how he corrected people, right? So we want to learn those manners so that our fellow converts do not feel alienated and not want to come back to our places of worship.
Absolutely. That is so, so important. And we, subhanAllah, you know, we've had a lot of converts that have felt chastised and felt, you know, like they don't belong in these, um, in our places of worship or, you know, spaces where they go. Um, I've had situations where I felt um, uncomfortable, uh, shake it off and move on. But there's some converts that, you know, come again from different walks of life and obviously deal differently, deal with these situations or uh, these environments differently and perhaps will not come back. Um, so we have to be very careful. We all have a responsibility and we have to take it very serious. I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already guided them to Islam it's really the work begins as us, as the ummah. How are we going to nurture? How are we going to take care of one another? How are we going to make sure that everybody is feeling comfortable and feeling safe? And so it's so important for us to make sure that when one makes mistakes, because as a convert, you don't know when your next mistake, which is six, the sixth point for today, uh, we don't know when we'll make another mistake because uh, oftentimes, there's always someone there to correct us and not always in the best manner. So the, the Quran says, um, and whoever is patient and forgives instead, that is of the manners um, requiring determination. So we have to make sure that we are always very patient. Again, patient is like a key uh, factor in our daily lives. And we have to forgive, right? So if somebody did something wrong, you're not going to act like the Haram police on day one. Uh, we need to get out of that mind frame and that mindset of, you know, my way or the highway. Because again, like Sister Renda was saying, we all come differently. We all understand differently. We all learn differently. And for us converts, we have to unlearn what we learned. So we, and, and as adults, most of us embrace Islam as adults, as people who have already been living a certain way of, uh, of life that is very difficult to unlearn. Is it impossible? Obviously not, because we're here today talking to you about this and we've turned our lives around. But Sister Renda has been Muslim 27 years. I've been Muslim over 15 years now, subhanAllah. And it's like, we have to make sure that we are very careful because just because they're labeled converts, new Muslim or revert, doesn't mean that they understood the way you and I perhaps understand the faith. And some people take, you know, one day to learn Al-Fatiha, some people take one year. It's not a right or wrong answer. Allah doesn't want um, perfection from us. He wants consistency. So as long as you're, you see that convert trying and, you know, um, again, there's a lot of learning disorders out there that you don't know. It's not like we, we, we have a, a you know, um, a label, you know, I'm dyslexic. And so you're going to understand that my way of learning is completely different than yours. So these are things that we need to take into consideration. We have to be very considerate to the other and um, converts are no exception. Any, any human is no exception. So the way the Prophet Sassam used to correct ideally the, the, the Sahaba and his companions was with kindness, right? Was never to discourage the other. They never felt chastised. They never felt embarrassed or humiliated. And so that's why it's, we have the manners of how to correct someone. And we just finished the book of correcting the, uh, the people uh, based on the teachings of our beloved prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But um, so that's, that's so important when it comes to, um, people making mistakes. We are bound to make mistakes. Our children are going to make mistakes. And so what makes you think that a convert will not make mistakes? We are going to make mistakes. Now, how we correct those mistakes can either make or break a convert. And so make sure that you act 
with kindness and compassion, the same type of mercy that you're looking from Allah, that's the same type of mercy that you got to give to his creation. And I can't utter that enough because I've seen it because we at Embrace deal with the broken pieces upon Allah. We're trying to nurture them, take care of them and bring them back to your communities. Yes, I have to say that because, you know, as Embrace, as we continue growing, Part of our mission and vision is for the converts to find a safe uh, mosque, a safe place of worship where they can become, um, you know, of asset to your communities, where they will be on board, um, you know, on, on uh, board members and will they be uh, leading different projects. So the only way that that's going to happen is if we're embracing one another with the same way we want to be embraced, right? So when we are correcting each other, just remember there is a right way. And the best way is the way the Prophet ﷺ used to correct everyone, no matter if he was a child or an elderly man. So let's make sure that we start learning those ways and make sure that we act with that compassion. And the, the story that comes to mind always, I think to many of us, is when the Bedouin was urinating in the mosque, right? He was urinating in our mosque, in a place of worship. How would you react? And how did the Prophet Sassam react? very differently perhaps you're there and you would react the same way and perhaps you're not so that's something for you to work on as an individual uh, to make sure that the next time you see a convert making a mistake you pull them aside and say you know i have some really wonderful advice for you and also don't just speak out of thought or out of opinion speak with the correct ideal so there is a hadith and make sure that these hadith are not weak and make sure that you, if you're talking about the Quran, you have that ayah. So when we are correcting someone, we have to make sure that we are correcting them with the truth um, because that is also important. I have seen it, I have heard it, and it's very dangerous. It's that fine line of danger, right? So let's make sure that if we don't know, we say we don't know. Um, and let's look for the answer together, but it seems wrong. Um, it doesn't seem right. Or where did you learn that? Or perhaps we can, we can get the answer together. And if you have a scholar, um, reach out to that scholar. We here at Embrace, we always offer our website to send your questions to our scholars uh, to make sure that you get those questions uh, answered uh, correctly. Absolutely. And I think, um, wouldn't you say also, Sister Nahela, that a lot of these points that we're bringing to you today also can be used to your youth that have been born in it, not necessarily in the country the parents were from. Um, these are things also we find the youth um, and the younger generation connecting more with how we're feeling. So I think these are across the board and it's all about manners, right? Adab. Uh, keeping our manners good in Islam, learning those manners, right? right. Um, one of the sisters here, one of our uh, viewers, Beth, Sister Beth, she says, my favorite story is the first time I went to the masjid, and this is an example of what Sister Nahela was talking about when someone's correcting a convert. I went to the masjid. I was so excited about completing my first prayers there. A lady pulled me aside afterward and congratulated me and then picked up my hand, slapped it, and said, next time, no. I had nail polish on. So she, <laughs> she slapped her hand and said no. So she would, that was her way of correcting her. So, um, you know, everybody has a different experience. And so the best way that you can help that person understand, maybe they're making a mistake, is to go up and say, hey, um, welcome to Islam. Yeah, I know you're new. Um, I want to be someone of a support for you. So if you need anything, let me know. If you have questions, I'll help you navigate them. And so instead of just going up and telling people, yeah, learn from the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi So gentle in the way he, um, you know, corrected people. So another thing, this is seventh point. We're almost done for the hour here. So we just have two more points. Um, we as converts don't know what you actually think of us. Um, in uh, Bukhari, Prophet Muhammad says, 
Not one of you can believe if you do not want for your brother what you want for yourself. And we heard Sister Nahala mention this earlier. Um, a lot of converts, when they come into Islam, they get a lot of praise and helpful words from fellow Muslims. But there's sometimes some animosity towards the converts that should be something extremely alien to our ummah, to our Muslim community. This animosity should not exist within our community. Um, it kind of resembles pre-Islamic attitude of racism. And as a convert, there's often a feeling of inferiority because, oh, I'm not Arab, I'm not Daisy, I'm not Palestinian, I'm not Lebanese, I'm not uh, Afghani, I'm not whatever. Um, and so that can lead the convert to acting like they're from a culture they're not from, that has nothing to do with Islam. And again, this had <clears throat> some of the issues that I, I um, encountered early on. And this is something that really needs to be resisted by converts, especially when you feel the urge or people are really, really pushing you to fit in to the Muslims around you so that you don't feel so different, right? And that could be if um, like in the beginning when I converted and I was mostly going to a mosque that was predominantly Daisy or Pakistani. And so the dress is different there than going to an Arab mosque. And so you feel like you have to fit in because you're standing out already as it is as a convert. Um, and now you don't wanna stand out more. So you try to blend in with them. And sometimes you can lose a part of who you are and you grew up with the culture too, right? So we wanna make sure we let converts retain their culture in a way that does not contradict Islam. So they, we as converts need to feel empowered and uplifted as Muslims. And we don't wanna feel like we're the most lowest common denominator. We have a lot that, com converts have a lot they can bring to the table. And to take that ability away from them is a crime. So it's like, it's, it's not really giving them confidence in who they are as a Muslim. It's putting them in the lowest ranks, like they don't really know and, oh, they're new. So we wanna be sure we're not doing that. Um, there's a story of Salman al-Farsi, a Persian companion of the Prophet وسلم, And he was the one to recommend a battle strategy in the battle of the trench against the Quraysh. Salman Arabs, Salman's Arab brothers in Islam took his opinion and used it to win the battle. But if Salman had an inferiority complex because of his Persian heritage, he might have not offered that opinion to them. Um, and so that is a very good example that he was Persian. He was giving the advice to the Arabs. The Arabs actually took the advice. They didn't question him or think, oh, you don't know. Um, and so he didn't have that inferiority complex. And I think that is an important point. Don't you think, Sister Nahela, that we deal with a lot of people, and I know I had it, an inferiority complex. Because of the, the environment you're in, you're not feeling like you can be you. You have to try to blend in no matter where you're at. And so that inferiority complex holds you back. And you can't be as much of an influence in your community when you have that issue. So um, remember, we have to make our convert brothers and sisters feel like they're valued and part of the community that links us to the culture around us. Absolutely, subhanAllah, how important that is. Um, I can't, I mean, <laughs> it's like taking me all over the place, right? Because I've dealt with so many situations, either personally or I've heard of or dealt with situations and so, yeah, a lot of times we want to fit in when we come into Islam. And because we don't know the difference between culture and Islam quite yet, we tend to go with whatever is pleasing to make sure that we fit in, right? And so oftentimes we lose our identity, we lose ourselves, and it becomes so overwhelming that our next point is our last and final point is that we sometimes second guess our decision because we're so lost in not knowing who we are anymore. We're not, we're not Pakistani, but we're dressing like Pakistani. We're not Moroccan, but we have that Jabalia or, you know, we're cooking, which is, there's nothing wrong with it as long as you don't lose who you are. And I think it was a very important that you said, you know, um, and I forgot what scholar mentioned this, 
Uh, but basically, you know, you can grab bits and pieces, whatever you feel comfortable without losing your identity, without losing who you are. Uh, I'll give you myself an ex as an example. I am very proud to be Mexican, but I, I choose to wear the abaya because I feel comfortable. That doesn't come from my native Mexico, but we do wear dresses. So it's seen as a dress. Um, now, obviously, the headscarf intertwines complete Arab looking uh, persona to my family. But still, my grandmother never wore pants in her life ever. So for me to adapt a dress like is not so foreign. It becomes foreign when we lose ourselves in that culture environment where we're just trying to fit in. And there's nothing wrong with fitting in again, but it's the other, the other, the other people also have to welcome us. And that's, that's where we play a big role as a society within our Muslim community. And we have to make sure that we welcome one another with open arms, with sincerity, right? Make sure that your intention is always seeking the pleasure of Allah. And you never know if this convert, this convert will be the one that will be speaking for you on the day of judgment. You don't know if that act of kindness, just like the prostitute that fed, you know, gave water to that dog will be the, and I'm not comparing, oh, uh, that just came into mind. I'm not comparing just the act of kindness, right? So let's make sure that we um, don't just drop my words, but we have to make sure that we, we act with sincerity, um, with love and compassion and treat each other uh, as what we are, brothers and sisters in Islam. Um, you know, subhanAllah, one of the reasons why Embrace was born and why this initiative took off is because of the lack of uh, compassion within our communities um, that happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Intentional, unintentional, that's not the, the, the point. The point is that many of our converts are in that revolving door. They're coming in and they're leaving out. And so... The statistics out there vary from, you know, 10 out of 10 leave Islam to 75% of the converts that come into the faith leave Islam. Those numbers are scary. They are just, they shouldn't be that way. Imagine all of our dawa that we've done for years and years at a time just being flushed down the toilet because of our lack of compassion, our lack of behavior, of good manners that our faith teaches us to begin with. So we have to be very cautious. The Prophet says, if, some, if someone does not show mercy to people, Allah will not show mercy to him. Um, and that's from Muslim and Al-Bukhari. So we have to make sure that, that, that we take care of Allah's creation the same way that we want Allah to take care of us on the Day of Judgment. Um, the other example I was going to mention is that when you get a convert under your wing, everything you teach that convert essentially will be written on your scale of good deeds. So imagine the opportunity that is given to you to not only treat your convert, your fellow convert reverts, new Muslims well, but you know, if your intention is, is pure and good, you are gaining reward. And if you, I'll give you a perfect example. If you teach a convert Al-Fatiha, we say Al-Fatiha 17 times a day for the rest of our lives. So imagine if instead of being critical and judgmental, we use that energy for goodness and focus and invest in our converts, such as teaching and guiding them in the best manner, all the reward you will get from that convert because he utters al fatiha 17 times a day. That's just a very small example. I remember the sister, um, may Allah reward her, the one that she actually encouraged me to take shahada. I was living the Islamic way already, but I felt that that was enough. And it was really nobody ever told me that I should take shahada except that one sister. She's like, I think today's the day. I think you should just, just 
say it. It's the last day of Ramadan. Come on. And I was so shy. I remember the, the, the message was so packed and I was so scared. And now that I think back, you know, that act of kindness for me to come into the folds of Islam, everything that I do goes back to that sister. So the opportunities are there, my beloved brothers and sisters. You know, we are part of your family. We, I don't consider myself any less than a born Muslim. I pray like you. I fast like you. I bleed like you. You know, we are seeking Jannah al those. So let's come together as family that we are to make sure that we are taking care of each other um, the minute that we interact with one another. And if you hear of someone in need, perhaps you are that dua. Allah is you're making you that dua being answered through you. So inshallah, let's not take each other as a burden, but as an opportunity of growth, of growth within ourselves, our communities. And you just never know, um, you know, that can become a convert can be your next best friend. If you're having a gathering, make sure you always invite that one person that you know that is doesn't have any family, is alone. Um, and so is there anything else you want to add sister Brenda? Yeah, I think it's just, I would really request that those of you that are in a Muslim community masjid that talk to the people in charge there and see if they have a committee there to welcome the new Muslims. Because I know when I moved to Texas, I came here because it's a huge Muslim community. Um, but I reached out multiple times and, and it wasn't, anybody did anything on purpose. It's just, we fall through the cracks sometimes. And it took years and me going, reaching out to multiple places. And so we wanna make sure that our mosques have a point of contact there for new Muslims who come in there, they take their shahada or another Muslim brings that new Muslim into the mosque. And we wanna make sure they have somewhere to go to talk and um, let the congregation know that they're new Muslims so that they can go and invite them. The sisters can make sure they they address them and they welcome them. and or the brothers, vice versa, right? So we wanna, we wanna be very mindful of those around us. Even if it's a new face in the masjid, it could be a born Muslim from somewhere else and they're having a hard time fitting in because we're not so inviting to one another all the time. And so we have to adopt the manners of a Muslim and we have to be welcoming. We have to make sure we're looking around us and making sure that there are pe people's needs are taken care of. We want to be caring about those people around us. And so I think it's just really important to be aware, be aware of your surroundings, um, learn from the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the manners of correcting each other and be patient and understand that all of us learn in a different manner. All of us have different backgrounds. And so we're not all going to do everything exactly the same, but keep in mind, we're doing it for the pleasure of Allah. And that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Jazakallah here. Absolutely. And so that um, concludes this uh, episode. We want to make sure that they're of benefit. And so show us that you are liking these episodes by not only liking it, but sharing it with those uh, in those groups or perhaps with those people that, you know, that can benefit from episodes such as this one, inshallah. Um Last but not least, uh, tonight we have the Embrace uh, Quran study, inshallah. And so that's also a place to come. Um, if you don't have a mosque, if you don't have a place um, tangible, know that we're here um, at Embrace and we have different uh, uh, opportunities to connect and believe it or not, I've met virtual sisters in person. So it does happen. So don't think because you're only behind a screen that that's not genuine relationships. Actually, they become very genuine, uh, very meaningful. And um, I've had sisters open their doors to their homes and fed me. And these are sisters that I've met during the pandemic. So um, do send them our way, inshallah. Tonight we have the Quran study. Tomorrow I will be giving the reminders. So do join me, inshallah. And then Saturday we have something very special for the sisters, right, Sister Rinda? Absolutely. We have been meeting for about a year and a half now 
on Saturday mornings from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. And that's Texas or Chicago time, if you're not familiar with that. Um, but we have a very wide array of sisters from all over the globe that have come into the class. We do have some regulars, and then we have sisters who pop in and out from time to time. And it's just a place to come in and connect and have a cup of tea or coffee while we're chatting. We do learn a little bit. We have, we have that spiritual aspect, but we have an open conversation, a very casual conversation where we can come in and express our feelings and ask questions and share things maybe that we reflect on in our own lives and how we can improve ourselves. So it's a wonderful time to make some new friends. And just as Sister Mihaela said, um, you know, these sisters can turn out being some lifelong friends, wonderful friends. Absolutely. And then we have step by step right after that. So if you know any new Muslims, we actually have a program designed for them uh, that teaches them from A to Z. So that's from uh, 11. No. Yeah. 12 to 1. 12 to 1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 12. Or 11, 11, sorry, 11 to 12. We have to get off in time for yeah. them. Sorry. <laughs> right. So we have programs happening uh, all weekend long. This weekend, we also have Pass the Mic, and our Connecticut um, chapter does the game night, which is really fun because you get to learn more about your dean through, uh, through games. And so normally we do either a what is that? Uh, Tahu or what is it? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so what is Jeopardy? And the other one is Kahoot. Kahoot. Kahoot and Jeopardy. And it's really fun. Um, so do join us on Sunday evening. Um, and more than anything, uh, make dua for our convert community. Make dua for our community. Make dua for everyone that is um, in distress and is going through any and all hardship. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our work um, that we do every day. Be patient and be merciful to yourself first and foremost, to your families and to your communities. Until next time, I am Nahela Morales and this is my co-host sister Arenda Datka. We'll see you next Thursday at 11 uh, Central Time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.